we're in Yeshaya, we started Parak Beis last week. Parak Beis begins page, on page 160 of your Art Scroll Yeshaya. <clears throat> we learned the first few psukim. This is a masa. Masa means it's one of the ten words that introduce the words of prophecy. A masa tells us that a prophecy is about to be said. And it also tells us that it's a burdensome, a masa, it's a burdensome, oppressive nebuah. And this particular masa deals with Yeshayo's vision of the destruction of the first base Hamikdash by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. As we explained last week, uh, we, read, we read the Rambam at the, hen, at the end of Hilchas Yisodei HaTorah, the Rambam says that a prophecy that is said and contains oppressive, painful news for a person, a community, a nation, does not have to come true. We, and we see that clearly by Nineveh. Yonah prophesies that God is going to destroy Nineveh, and at the end he did not destroy Nineveh at that time because the people did tshuva. That does not mean that Yonah was a false prophet, chas v'sholem. The rule is that once a prophet is designated a prophet through the procedures uh, that the Gemara enumerates and that the Rambam sets forth in Hilchus Yisodei HaTorah, once he's a accepted prophet, the fact that he prophesizes about a particular, um, particular calamity that's going to happen and it doesn't happen, we attribute that to people having done tshuva. It doesn't undo his status as a true Navi. On the other hand, a Navi that prophesizes that something good is going to happen to a person or to a nation, and that doesn't happen, then we know he is a false prophet. If he ever was a true prophet, he no longer is a prophet. If he was never proven to be a prophet, we simply assume that he's a false prophet uh, as the initial matter. So the fact that here Yeshayo is telling us about the calamity that is chas v'shom going to befall Yerushalayim and the destruction of the first base Hamikdash through the Babylonians does not necessarily mean, excuse me, does not necessarily mean that that has to happen. It means that this is going to happen if you don't do tshuva. <clears throat> So the Pasik that we're up to and the subject we're going to look at today is the subject of Chil Hashem. That's what we spoke about last week. The Psukim introduce us to this idea that when Jerusalem is desecrated, when the Beis Hamikdash is destroyed, when the Jews are oppressed by nations of the world, that causes a Chil Hashem. It causes the desecration of God's name, Chas v'sholem, because people, on, onlookers, see that either God can't protect his city, Jerusalem, he can't protect his nation, the Jewish people, and we end up, Chas v'sholem, having a Chil Hashem. And this idea was introduced by Moshe Rabbeinu himself. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was pleading with HaKadosh Baruch Hu for, 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 um, to, to, not to punish the Jewish people, Moshe Rabbeinu said, Lama yomu Mitzrayim. After the Chet Ha'ego, the Moshe Rabbeinu said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you can't destroy the Jewish people because Lama yomu Mitzrayim, Bara Hotziyom, Laharagosam Beharim, why will you why would you give the Goyim the opportunity to say that you took these people out of Mitzrayim to kill them in the midbar? Don't do that, Rabbi Shalom. So this became a very fundamental prayer from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Shalom. If um, calamity befalls the Jewish people, it'll be a desecration of your name. After the Chet Hamaraglim, the again Moshe Rabbeinu prayed and said, It's going to be a Chil Hashem. What will the Goyim say? The Goyim will say, 
that you are powerful enough to save the Jewish people from one kingdom, Mitzrayim, you took them out of Mitzrayim, but now when they have to enter Eretz Yisrael and there are 31 separate kings and armies in Eretz Yisrael, the 31 Malachim, you didn't have the power to conquer 31 Malachim, and therefore you killed these people in the desert. Again, Moshe Rabbeinu is approaching HaKadosh Baruch Hu and saying, Rabbeinu Shalom, you need to protect the Jewish people. If not for the sake of the Jewish people, it's for the sake of your name. It shouldn't be desecrated. And we say this in Avinu Malkeinu. There's Navino Malkeinu, Avinu Malkeinu, Ase Laman Shimcha Gol, Hagiba Vanoiva Shinikro Aleinu. Avinu Malkeinu, Ase Laman Shimcha. Rabbana Shalom, save the Jewish people already for your sake, for the sake of the holiness of your name, that it should Hashem not be desecrated. In this, in, in this vein, there is a story that's told about. Um, it's it just, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but the story itself uh, demonstrates this point and demonstrates how sensitive we need to be to this idea of Kol Hashem. There's a family in the old Russia under the, under the czarist rule <clears throat> and a small little village. And this, this part of the story is a factual part of the story. There were times in old Tsarist Russia where in small villages, they would send a policeman arbitrarily into Jewish homes on the night of Pesach because they had the blood libel. The Jewish people are using blood of, of Gentile children. Of course, Kashom, not that nothing, no such thing ever happened, but they created the blood libel. And arbitrarily, they would have police go in or citizens, goyim of the city, go in to different Jewish homes and sit through the Seder to see if there's any blood coming out or any blood in the matzah. So there's this Jewish family in a small village. <clears throat> and the same guy comes to check on them every year. And he sits there at the table for the whole Seder. And of course, the Seder, the father reads the Haggad in Hebrew. He translates it for his family into Russia, into Russian. They get to the end of the Haggadah and they say, Lashona Habab Yerushalayim, Lashona Habab Yerushalayim, Habanuya. And they sing it and the father translates it into Russian. And the guy listens to it year one, next year in the, in the rebuilt Jerusalem. Again, next year, the guy comes and he's singing next year and the, and the family singing next year in rebuilt Jerusalem. And this goes on for years. And the guy understands what's being said. It's being translated into Russian. And finally, the father, at, after a number of years, says, they sing Lashana Habab Yushlam Nuya, and the family singing along and the father translate into Russian next year in rebuilt Jerusalem. And then the father adds a comment and he says, Rabbi He says, Rabbi shik shine seeds of Mashiach, Valach Shem Zachshain Father Goy. He says, Rabbi Shalom, please already send Mashiach to bring the base Hamikdash to rebuild the city of Jerusalem because I'm ashamed already for the Goy. The Goy is here every year. And every year I say in front of him, next year uh, we will be in rebuilt Jerusalem. Every year he hears the same thing, and every year it doesn't happen. He already thinks we're silly, stupid people, that there's really this, this rebuilt Jerusalem is not going to happen. It's embarrassing for the guy already. It's already in Echel Hashem, Rabbi Shalom. Rabbi Shalom already rebuilt Jerusalem. So we're going, we started looking at this last week. We're going to look at it some more today. We're going to see how this idea of the linkage between what happens to the Jewish people and that which, quote unquote, happens or, quote unquote, affects the Rebbe Hashem. Of course, the word affects the Hashem is not a correct term. Nothing affects him. Affect means there's some kind of change. It affected the someone's something happened to Uve and he was affected in this and this way, became happy, became sad, 
Things don't affect the Rebbe Shalom. We've talked about that many times. The Rebbe Shalom doesn't get happy, doesn't get sad. But in order to be able to speak the language, Divritari Koloshim B'nai Adam, the Ramam says, the first parak of Hilfes Yisraeli we need to use these words. So there's a direct linkage between what happens to us and the way God is perceived. That may be the best way to say it. There's a direct linkage between what happens to Jews in the world and the perception that the world has about our God. That linkage is the question of Chilol Hashem. So <clears throat> Yeshayo is prophesizing about the Babylonian exile, the destruction by Nebuchadnezzar of the first base Hamikdash, and we were learning Pasuk Dalit. Page 162. Alkain Amardi, therefore I said, we mentioned last week there were two explanations to this al Amarti. One is that this is still the part of the words of the prophecy. These are God's words in Yeshayahu's mouth. God is saying, what is God saying? Sh'umini, leave me alone. I don't want anyone to try to console me. Amorer babechi, I want to be left alone. So that I can we I can weep bitterly. Al do not insist on comforting me. I'll show a bas ami for the calamity of I'll show bas ami for the calamity of my people. So even though the Jewish people um, they have this prophecy, and the prophecy is about going to happen over a hundred years from now. Yeshayo is over a hundred years before the destruction of the first base Hamikdash. So he's prophesizing, if you don't do tshuva, then there's going to be a destruction of the first base Hamikdash. And if you don't do tshuva and the base Hamikdash is destroyed, then God is going to say, leave me alone. I don't want anyone to try to comfort me. I'm going to weep bitterly. I'll show Bas Ami for the calamity that has befallen my nation. And what we emphasized last week was that this is um, I'll show Bas Ami. God is still talking to, uh, to the Jewish people as my people, the calamity of my people. They have been warned for over a hundred years to do tshuva, and they and if they don't do tshuva, the base Hamikdash will be destroyed. When the base Hamikdash is destroyed. Over a hundred years passed, and they didn't do tshuva. And we're going to soon see uh, how they conducted themselves in that period of time. They didn't do tshuva for over a hundred years. That caused the base Hamikdash and Jerusalem to be destroyed. And God is still speaking in terms of, "Don't comfort me. I am weeping over the calamity of my people. They are still my people." <clears throat> So we read last week on page 163, the art scroll note, I'll show Bas Ami. Klipaz comments that God, speaking through Yeshayahu, is lamenting. Here he adds a dimension to the calamity. There's a new dimension to the calamity. It's not just a calamity for the Jewish people. It's, quote, unquote, a calamity for God's name. The nation is mine. They are God's people. So the conquest of Jerusalem is a desecration of his name as amplified in the next verse. So we said last week that we would take a look at this more in depth. There's a Pasuk in Hazinu. Hazinu is the Parsha that we have Kabbalah on. The Vilna Goni talks about it. Parshas Hazinu, the le- next to the last parsha in the Torah, after Hazinu comes with Zeis and then we read on Simchas Torah. Hazinu is the history of the whole world, from creation up until and after Bias Mashiach. Everything is in Hazinu. You just have to know how to learn Hazinu. In Hazinu, there's a pasuk that says that God. 
is going to lift the Jewish people up to great heights. They are going to be a very successful people. They are going to be a very wealthy people. In Eretz Yisrael, they will prosper. And then the Rabboni Shlolem warns that from all that prosperity and success in Eretz Yisrael, Vayishman Yeshurun, Yeshurun is another name for the Jewish people, Yeshurun. Vayishman Yeshurun, Vayivat. Yeshurun, the Jewish people became fat and success. Vayivat, and they will rebel against God from their prosperity and their success during times of prosperity and success is the ultimate Nesoyen of your Amun and Bitochna Kaddish Baruch Hu. Savarim talk about this, Vasemis in particular talks about this. Um, in America, I guess they would say there's no atheist in the foxhole. When people are in dire straits, loyal we should know from such things. Amun and Bitochon pop up in our minds. And that's when we dive in with more kavana, and that's when we say more tehillim, and that's when we give more tzedakah. When we are, however, fat on success, vayishman, shamen, when we become fat on success, then success breeds a certain amount of arrogance, and maybe the davening is not with such, so much kavana, and maybe not so much tehillim, and maybe not so much tzedakah, and maybe not so much kamila sasadim, because the prosperity is shining on us. And there is where a person has to actually activate his emunah and be talking to understand that his prosperity and success is a gift from the Rabbi Shalom, and therefore he needs to be mispal, he needs to do chesed in order for the Rabbi Shalom to continue the um, bestowing success and prosperity on him. So there's this danger which we generally call a person gets successful, the Torah says, and he says, I did this. I'm strategically, I'm a financial strategic genius. I know when to buy in the market. I know when to sell in the market. I know when to get out of the market. I know when to get into the market. And I'm a genius. The Torah warns us. In that vein, the Pasik says in Hazinu, Vayishman Yeshurin Vayiva. The Klal Yisrael will get fat on their success and they will rebel. Shamanta Avisa Kasisa, Vayitosh Elaka Aso, you will then forsake the God who made you and gave you the success. Vayinabel, the word Vayinabel comes from Naval. Sur Yeshu also, and you will cause a navala, you will cause a disgrace to the rock of your salvation. The Ibn Ezra, as quoted by the Ramban in Pasha's Hazinu, the Ibn Ezra on this Pasik says as follows It says that you will get fat on success, you will forsake God. And if you forsake God, you will disgrace God. So how do you learn that puzzle? Does it mean that after, after the Jews forsake God, chas v'sholem, they will then go on and create a chil Hashem? In other words, we're talking about something the Jewish people do. They will get fat on success. They will forsake God. And they will disgrace God's name. So to that, the Ibn Ezra says a different shot. The Apostle reads as follows. They will get fat on success. They will forsake God. And when the Jewish people forsake God and they are punished for forsaking God, God will be disgraced. It will be a chil Hashem because the nations of the world will see Jewish people punished and they will say that the Jewish God cannot protect his people. So I'm now reading from the Ibn Ezra as quoted by the Ramban. Rabavram Oma Vayinabel, Rabavram, the Ibn Ezra says that the word this to disgrace uh, God, Shegoram Lechal Es Hashem, 
the Jewish people will not, the, it doesn't mean the Jewish people will forsake God and then go out in the streets and dis disgrace him. The Jewish people will forsake God and they will be punished. And that will cause a disgrace because it will then be a chil Hashem. It will disgrace God's name because people look and say, why are the Jewish people suffering like this? It must be that God has forsaken them or it must be that God can't protect them. So you have here a situation where an Aveira, let's call this a national sin, the national sin of forsaking God, which is the discussion in Pasha's Hazinu, results in punishment for that sin. Now there's a whole new sin that occurs. Because of that national sin, the Jews are punished. And when they are punished, they cause that punishment to come upon them. And that punishment now creates a Chil Hashem, which is a whole different sin. And that sin causes the desecration of Hashem's name. So it's two sins here. There's the initial sin of getting fat on your success and forsaking God for which you're punished. And then because of the punishment, you're creating a Chil Hashem which chas v'shon could mean even more punishment. This is the basis of Yeshayahu's Nevoah. Now, in Pasek Dalit, God said, al kein amart mini amorer bebechi. I want to bitterly cry. Now we talk again, we talked about this a few minutes ago. We talked about it many times. God doesn't cry. This is Dibra Torah Colossian B'nai Adam. The Navi is repeating God's words, but these are words that are being told to us because we're being spoken to as human beings. The Rabboni Shalom through Yeshaya is describing what's happening in heaven. In human terms, it doesn't mean that God is shedding tears. He doesn't have a physical body. It doesn't mean he's actually crying like a human being. This is Dibritar Kalashim Adam. It means that in heaven, something is happening that in the heavenly sphere, there's quote unquote a sadness. What does that sadness cause? So we read last week, uh, for example, the art scroll on page 162 or 163 quotes this. Rashi Anmegish Echa says that the meaning here is Shu many Amorer Babechi. Don't try to comfort me. I'm going to weep in my in a bitter weep. It doesn't mean that God's crying a bitter weep. It means that something is happening in heaven that we would call something sad is happening. What's said that's happening? So Rashi says that the Rabboni Shalom instructed his angels or will instruct his angels if the Churban occurs as Yeshayo prophesizes, God will instruct his angels not to sing Shira, not to sing his praises in Shemaim as we know the, the ministering angels do. God will say, this is not the time for singing my children are suffering a calamity. I don't want you to sing my praises. So that is an example of what the Pusik can mean. Doesn't mean that God's crying. It doesn't mean that he's shedding tears. It means that there is an environment in heaven that will show a sadness. In human terms, when a king is sad and unhappy and his ministers want to come in, and give him and uh, sing sing uh, great songs of praise for him. He says, please leave the room. I want to be left alone. That's what happens in a human palace, a human king's palace. And Dibra Torah Kaloshim Neodam, the Torah, the Rav Shalom communicates to us in a way that we can understand it in human terms. So the Rav Shalom is saying, leave me be. I'm going to cry bitterly. No human tears. Cry bitterly means something is happening in heaven that in human terms you would understand the sadness. 
One example, Rashi says, is that Ramon Shalom says the ministering angel that not to sing my praise this evening. The Gemara in Chagiga, Adaf Hei Amit Beis, before we even do that, okay, we can do that. We learned Pasuk Dalit, yeah. The Gemara in Chagiga, Adaf Hei Amit Beis, quotes a, quotes a Pasuk in Yirmiya. The Pasuk in Yirmiya says, Yirmiya chapter 13, and if you don't hear what I'm saying, the Mistarim Tifkanafshi in my secret closed chamber, this is God speaking through Yirmiya. If you don't hear me, then I will go into my secret closed chamber, the Mistarim my secret closed chamber, Tifkanafshi. And in that enclosed secret chamber, I am going to cry. Mepne gave. I am going to cry because of the gave. So the Gemara says, Amar Rav Shmuel Bar Unya Meshmeid Rav. Rav Shmuel Bar Unya comment in the name of Rav. Mokon Yesh La Kadosh Baruch Hu Umistarim Shemo. God has a place called Mistarim. Now we understand that this is an Agadic Gemara, and again the Gemara is using this. Uh, the Gemara is using this concept of Dibra Torah Kaloshim and Eodim, which trying to communicate an idea, the very idea that Yirmiyahu is saying, as the Gemara explains, that God has a place that He goes into to cry. Right, contradicts the entire concept that God has no place. God is everywhere. He's not in any particular room. But again, we're getting an, a, a message here so that we as human beings can understand this. The Rabbana Shalom is saying through Yirmiyahu, if you don't listen to me, I am going into my mistarim. I'm going into my hidden secret chamber. Tif Genafshi, and in that secret hidden chamber, I will cry out my soul. Mepne Gave, because of Gave. We don't know what Gave is yet, but the first statement of the Gemara of Rav Shmuel Bar Onya Mishmei Darav, Mokoy Yesh Lakadish Baruch, God has a place. God doesn't have any physical place, He's not limited anywhere. But in order for us to understand this, in terms of what a human being can understand, Yirmiyo is telling us, imagine that a king, a human king has a room and it's a hidden secret room. And what does this king do in that secret room? <clears throat> Mistarim Shemoy. The name of this room is Mistarim. Mepne <clears throat> Gave. And God is crying in this room because of Gave. Gave comes from the word Gaava. Gava means, in a bad way, Gava means a very, very uh, arrogant or very, a, a kind of person that is a Balgaiva. So God goes into this hidden room and he cries because of Gaiva. Amar Rav Shmuel, so that's uh, Gemara brings down Amar Rav Shmuel by Yitzchak. God cries in this secret room <clears throat> because of the, the high status, the ga'ava, the high status of the Jewish people that they once had, and it was taken away from them at the Chorban, and it was given to the Goyim. The Goyim have become dominant nations in the world, and the Jewish people have become subjected by them. And Rabboni Shalom goes into the secret chamber, and Kaviyochel cries in there about this situation where his people have become subjected to the nations of the world who now become dominant, whereas the true the true state of affairs of the world should be the Jewish people should be dominant and the nations of the world should be subjected to the rule of the Jewish people as they were in the days of Shlomo HaMelech. We say this on Rosh Hashanah in the capital to Hillel, 
Korach Mizmor, we say Yad Ber Amim Tachtenu Ulo Umim Tachas Raglenu. Rabbonu Shalom subject the nations of the world to the rule of the Jewish people, which doesn't mean that we're egomaniacs. It means subject the rule of the world to the Jewish people, because the Jewish people will subject the world to the rule of law, meaning the rule of God. So we're going to turn the world into the Saken Olam B'Malcha Shakai. It's going to be a world dedicated to God. And when we say subject the nations of the world, to the Jewish people, we're not looking to be um, conquerors. We're not looking to take over the world. We are looking to create Lasakin Oilam Bamalchus Shakai. So the Rabbana Shalom goes into the secret room and he cries in the secret room because the Jewish people's dominance over the world, which would have brought about Lasakin Oilam Bamalchus Shakai a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, a tremendous sanctification of God's name. And instead, the Goyim have taken over to dom, the, the, dominate the world. The Jewish people are subjected to them. This is a Chilul Hashem. And for that Chilul Hashem, God goes off into his room and cries. When it says he cries because the, the Jewish people are no longer dominant and the nations of the world are dominant, He's crying because, through, because the Jewish people have lost their dominance in the world. God has lost his dominance in the world. We are God's messengers. So God goes into this room and he's crying because through our loss of dominance in the world, the Rabboni Sholom Loyaleinu Kaviyochel suffers this Chil Hashem, the desecration of God's name. So then the Gemara says, how is it possible to say that God cries? The Gemara is not asking about the physical aspect. We already explained there is no physical aspect. This is It's a message in human terms. Rav Papa said that in the heavenly spheres before God, there's no such thing as sadness at all. Shenemar. <clears throat> Pasuk says, Hod v'hodol v'fonov, oz v'ched v'bimkomo. We say this Pasuk um, in, in uh, Hodu every day in davening. It's a familiar Pasuk. Hod v'hodol v'fonov, oz v'ched v'bimkomo. Where God is, there's ched There's a tremendous amount of happiness. So how can you say where God is, that there's a place where God, quote unquote, is crying. Wherever God is, it's oz v'ched b'mkomo. So Gemara says, lo kasha, ha v'bote gavoy, ha v'bote b'roy. We're talking about two different things. We're talking about an inner chambers and an outer chambers. All the outer chambers have the rule of oz v'ched b'mkomo. There is no such thing as sadness, it's complete simcha in the presence of God. When we're talking about that God, quote unquote, is crying over the loss of Jewish domination in the world, that's a bote gavoy. Those are that, that secret inner chamber. There, there's such a thing as, quote unquote, God crying. So the Gemara asks, uba bote baroy lo, and in the outer chambers, you're telling me there is no sadness. The sadness is only in the inner chamber of the Mistarim. The outer chambers is what? Oz v'chedva b'mkomo. It's a chedva. It's a tremendous simcha where God is. V'hoksiv. The Pasuk says, our Pasuk in Yeshaya, Perekhof Aleph, Perekhof Beis, Pasuk Dalit. It says, Vayikra Hashem Halokim. Okay, it's a Parsic English. I'm reading from a small Gemara. So 
um, age has taken its toll on my eyes. Bar Hashem. Vayikra Hashem Elohim Tzavokris Vayim Hahu Levachi Ula Mispet Ula Karcha Ula Chakosak. This is a Pasuk later in our Parakaf Beis. It says that God called the day of the Churban Beis HaMikdash. It's a day of crying. It's a day of eulogies. It's a day of, quote unquote, ripping out one's hair, which we'll deal with next week, putting on sackcloth. Now that Pasuk is talking about God decreed a day of crying. It does not talk about his inner chamber. What did, what did the Gemara say? The Pasuk in Yirmiya that says God cries in his inner chamber, that's only in the inner chamber. That's a place called Mistarim, the secret inner chamber. Outside that inner chamber, there's only Oz v'chedva. there's only Simcha. But yet we have a Pasuk in Yeshaya Chafbeis that is not talking about the inner chamber, it's talking about the outer chamber, the, the, Gemara, the Pasuk doesn't say mistarim. In Yirmiya, it says mistarim, and we say that's the inner chamber. In Perakhaf Beis of Yeshaya, it doesn't say mistarim. It just says that at the Churban Beis HaMikdash, God called for a day of crying. So we're not talking about the inner chamber. How can there be crying if it's not the inner chamber? In the outer chamber, it's only Oz v'chedva. So the Gemara says, shiny Churban Beis HaMikdash. The destruction of the Beis Hamikdash is a completely different event. At any rate, the Purim Beis Hamikdash is a completely different event, and that caused "quote unquote" crying in heaven, even in the outer chambers. So while "quote unquote" there's a special chamber where God cries for the lack, for the loss of Jewish dominion over the world, which results in lack of God's dominion over the world. We are God's representatives in the world. If we lose dominion over the world and we lose the Beis HaMikdash, and the Beis HaMikdash is not the center of religious affairs of the world, as it was, for example, the day of Shlomo Melech, when kings and, and queens came from all over the world to meet Shlomo and to talk with Shlomo and to try to... Uh, and, and to try to see the Beis HaMikdash, and they heard about the wisdom of Shlomo, when that is lost, that's a calamity not only for the Jewish people, but it's Chatz Shalom, also a Chil Hashem. So when the Jewish people lose that dominion, God loses Kaviyochel dominion, and God goes into his Mestar in his secret chamber, and he cries, quote-unquote, about that. Outside this chamber... It's Oz v'chedva. It's always Simcha, except on the day of the Churban Beis HaMikdash. There was crying even in all the outer, quote-unquote, chambers, whatever these chambers are. So that's Pasuk Dalit. Al kein amarti she'u mini amarer babechi, al ta'itzul nachameni, al shod bas ami. We'll read Pasuk Hei for today. Why? What's happening? What's going to happen? Pasakei on page 162. A very, very, very um, strong Pasuk. We'll read it in English. Page 163. For it is, uh, verse 5, for it is a day of breaking and trampling and confusion unto Hashem, Master of Legions, in the Valley of Vision. We explained last week, Gehi Zayon, the Valley of Vision, means Yerushalayim for the reasons we mentioned last week. Of breaching the wall, the wall of Jerusalem will be broken into and crying out upon the mountain. So this is sort of a summary of what's happening. If the Jew, what will happen if the Jew, the Jews do not do tshuva? They'll be breaking, trampling, confusion in Yerushalayim. The wall of Yerushalayim will be breached, and they will be crying on the mountains by the Jewish people. 
And now the Pasik tells us that other nations will come to help Bavel destroy Yushalayim and destroy the Beis Hamikdash. And one of those nations is Elam. Elam was the capital at that time of the Persia. Remember, there's no Persian quote unquote empire, there's Persia. Bab Babylon ruled basically the world at that time. And Babylon continued to rule the world until um, the Persians defeated the Babylonians. Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, was the Babylonian king at the time the Persians uh, defeated the Babylonians. But Elam is a capital city in Persia at that time. And on page 164, the Pasik tells us, Yeshayo prophesizes, Ve'elam nasa ashba berechev odom paroshim ve'kir eram again. Elam has taken up its quiver. It'll come with many bows and arrows to help Nebuchadnezzar destroy Yerushalayim and destroy the base of Mikdash. With chariots of men and horsemen and to the wall, they attach their shields. So other nations are going to come. If you don't do tshuva, not only is Bavel coming, but other nations of the world are also coming to assist Bavel, destroy Yerushalayim, destroy the Beis Hamikdash, Nebuch, do tshuva. And unfortunately, the Jews didn't listen for over a hundred years, and these things actually, unfortunately, unfolded. And have your main of Barat Hashem will be zayich to the opinion based on Mikdash today. So we are in Perek of Beis now, and we are up to verse 7 in Yet Hashem for next week.